Okay guys, here we are. Turn off Adnac Road. We're going for the Halo Mine today. So almost right away on your left, there's a little inlet here where you can park and you can head up to the Kenmak Shibugamu Mine. A uh, well-known area for, here's, the, here's where you can park. Um, really well known for its uh, uh, beta fight crystals, I believe it is. Moraine Drive, that's our next turn. Come the dead of winter, you, winter you're going to have a problem here. So make sure uh, you're careful with the car. Uh, not the best of roads. So uh, serious uranium exploration began in Canada in 1942. Uh, and that was basically for military use. Um, and with the ban on private prospecting uh, lifted in 1947, uh, the pace of exploration began to grow. It was in the early 1950s that Bancroft's deposits were uh, discovered. And uh, by 1956, there were only three deposits left in operation. So Moraine Drive it takes a sharp uh, right-hand curve here at the top of this little hill. And to the left, <clears throat> There's a trail that leads on to the Halo Mine. I parked my car right here because this gets kind of rugged pretty shortly. Um, and I'm going to walk. It's quite a little walk. Probably take me about an hour. Nobody builds a bridge like this in the middle of nowhere without a very good reason. And that reason is going to be the Halo Mine. Obviously they're investing a fair bit of money in a property whose primary commodity was uh, uranite. And this was, of course, part of the big boom in the 1950s, um, early 1950s, when they were exploiting uh, uranium from this particular area. So if we're talking very specifically about this Bancroft area, we're talking the area around Wilberforce uh, and east of, or excuse me, west of Bancroft. Uh, by 1954, uh, we saw at least uh, 50 local Bancroft property, properties being uh, exploited for radioactives. Now, this is all different kinds of geological settings, uh, but there were indeed three distinct phases of exploration. Uh, the first phase uh, in the Bancroft area was in the early 30s, and that was marked specifically by development at the Richardson property. Uh, second uh, period was in the late 1940s. Uh, that was marked by further development at the Richardson property, and we're talking a significant amount of underground development as well as shafts. Um, and also work by the lead ura mines uh, and you've seen a video of mine before uh, from the um, rare earth property near Torrey Hill. Guys, look at this. So in that second period, uh, 1947 to 1952, the Canadian government had set the price for uranium ore, um, thus guaranteeing a secure but short-term market. And then the last phase was 1953 to 1954, uh, and that was the widespread staking rush across the whole area. So as I mentioned in my, uh, my first book in, this, in the Rockhound series, Rockhound and Experience of the North, um, basically, as I said at the World Nuclear Association's 14th Annual Symposium in London, the roar from the great Canadian uranium rush was so great in 1953 that you could hardly hear the Geiger counters ticking. Stay right here. Do not follow that path. I made that mistake last time. Keep to the right. Down the bottom of this hollow, the road definitely uh, gets pretty wet. Uh, in this case, it's uh, iced over. Uh, overflow from a marsh, no doubt, doing of the beavers again. Seeing all sorts of footprints around here. Wolf, um, all sorts of unnamed little critters, probably martens or fishers or whatever. Look at the frost or the mist has uh, coated the tops of the trees. Just beautiful today. Absolutely a beautiful day. So, I gotta admit, it's not exactly where it appears by the aerial photographs and the, uh, the marker on it, but um, nevertheless, I found one of the added entrances. We've got two entrances. Um, this was discovered by a gentleman called Hogan, so it was also called the Hogan Mine. We've got um, basically a cyanite, which I'm looking at right here. It's this reddish material. Uh, this is where the uranite was found, and it basically there's a, a pegmatite seam somewhere here tapping into the, uh, the actual mine, which is apparently really rich in zircon, rare earths, 
thorium, all sorts of incredible goodies. So this is the turnoff to the to the um, Halo Mine. Basically, it's a trail that leads down slope towards Halls Lake. That goes onwards. Don't know where. You're going to come to a fork. You're going to take the right fork after this right fork. That'll lead you down past the Adits and down to a rubble beach. There are three geological settings uh, in this particular area around Bancroft in which uh, uranium is found. So geologically speaking we've got the pegmatites, we're talking the segregated pegmatites and the non-segregated pegmatites. You've got the metasomatics, the limestones and the metapyroxenes and you've got vein deposits. Uh, this particular deposit, uh, the halo mine, is one of the metasomatic deposits. But when we're talking about granitic pegmatites, that is the segregated pegmatites, uh, we're talking about deposits with large crystals, pure minerals, um, a country rock and uh, an actual dike within which these larger crystals occur. And this dike has very specific defined walls. And the kind of radioactives we're looking at uh, would typically be titanites, tantalums, columbiums, uh, rare earths. Uh, is rarely found as uranite. Now, also within the pegmatites, there's, uh, there's the cyanite pegmatites. So we're talking granitic pegmatites, which are segregated, and cyanite pegmatites. The cyanites, they, they'll have a varying grain size. Um, the minerals are not segregated. There's going to be a distinct lack of zoning in the dikes. Uh, peristatite is pretty common. So you're talking things like Crystal Lake. Um, usually uranothorites and uranite being the radioactive minerals. You seldom find titanite, seldom find columbite, tantalite, and there's going to be a brick red coloration to most of the uh, uranium bearing zones. Metasomatics, that is the limestones and metapyroxenes. They're often the scarn minerals that you're going to find in the limestone. We're talking diopsides, tremolites, apatites, epidote. Uh, the carbonates will typically be this sort of brick red color or maybe a salmon pink and usually within those you're going to find uranothorite and uranite. And then there's the vein deposits, I'm talking like the Schickler occurrence. So within a vein deposits uh, around this Bancroft area where you're finding the radioactives, we're talking um, uh, there's going to be calcite, fluorite and apatite, um, hornblende, and uh, black mica, all in quite large crystals. Uh, Bear Lake springs to mind as a, as a good example of that kind of thing. So sometimes you're going to find uranite and pyrochlor, uh, and right there we're thinking of the, the basin property. Uh, the apatite will typically be dark red, and the fluorite will be this deep purple. Quartz, again, typically quite dark. We're talking smoky quartz. It becomes smoky because of the radioactive nature of the minerals around that quartz. So somewhere deeper in, I can hear this dripping going on. Um, I'm not too inspired to go deep into this. It looks kind of crumbly. Uh, somewhere in one of the two adits, there's apparently a, a shaft going upwards. Uh, some pretty cool icicles, I must admit, right? But as I say, um, I don't want to tap this too far. This doesn't look like an entirely stable structure. Special thanks to uh, Frank Festa for his good uh, information on Mindat. It's kind of what set me off in this direction. Um, pretty spectacular walk. It's just beautiful, lovely for a winter walk. Um, and again, uh, I'm sure right around here there's got to be some ore piles. I can see a lot on the actual track heading inwards. And um, just looking here at this uh, cyanite here, this is your, your cyanite, very low in silica. You can see all sorts of goodies, minerals, uranite maybe. What really concerns me is a lot of these beautiful old relics from earlier days, they're being what they call rehabilitated and uh, basically destroyed. And to me, I mean, this stuff's an endless source of fascination. Um, very concerning. It's kind of mysterious. A little bit of artesian pressure coming out of this pipe. It comes from who knows where. But uh, you can see uh, we're right on the edge of the uh, dumps just to the right of the path between Halls Lake. It looks like they dumped all the uh, the debris that came out of the uh, mines themselves, but you're going to have to scoop off the snow, or better yet, come in the summertime to uh, to do your searching. Here in this little hollow, we see the other added entrance. 
Um, just off from the side of the path here, I mean, you really can't miss it. Um, I absolutely cannot think of a more beautiful place to come and camp and do some rock hounding at the same time. Here we are, we're on this little uh, gravelly sort of beach. Uh, there's a path leading straight from the two adits. No doubt the um, actual shaft is up in the forest, which I will head up and look for in a minute, but just, I mean, look at this. Dead silence. Absolute beauty. This is just part of the rock hound experience. This is what you got that you can clamber through. No doubt you'll find all sorts of trace little elements and um, crystals from within the cyanite and the, and the pegmatite layer. Fair bit of smoky quartz. That's quite indicative of radiation. Little tiny cubic crystals in this white matrix here. Um, it makes you wonder more of the same. This looks more like the shaft. You got a big concrete platform here. Uh, ooh, what's this? Ah, there's a hole there. Strong breeze coming out of it. This is like, this is just like the uh, rare earth mine. So seeing the adit, or the, um, seeing the shaft, the capped shaft, it's probably about a hundred meters inwards. I saw it on the surface. Um, so this is obviously quite an extensive kind of a tunnel uh, and all the rubble out on the beach um, mainly from from the other added entrance which is closer to the beach I'm not sure where all the, the rubble from this particular one is but uh, somewhere I can back out here near the dripping way off somewhere off in the background there these lovely icicles. It's beautiful. It's almost cave-like in a way. And that was one of my reasons for coming up on this trip was to try and search out a couple of caves, but didn't have a great deal of luck there. So you'd expect within the dumps to find pretty much what you have in the pegmatite, through which which cuts the cyanite behind me. Uh, we're talking peristatite, much like at Crystal Lake. Um, we're talking microcline, uh, felspar, quartz, uh, and I guess from the pegmatite apparently little veins are going outwards which have fluorite and calcite in them which is uh, pretty cool to find as well. But it's obviously way deeper in here. Um, you know, I, I question the, the, uh, the safeness of actually going into an added, especially one looking like this.